So hi, um, thanks again everyone for coming. Um, welcome. Uh, this is the Applying Production Engineering uh, Mindset to RPM Packaging. And my name is Michelle Lind. I uh, work at Meta as a Production Engineer. So um, a bit more about me. I've been a Fedora contributor since about 2004. Um, I currently sit in the Apple steering committee for those um, doing uh, enterprise Linux packaging. Uh, and I'm also in uh, FESCO right now. So please don't submit uh, weird change proposals because I have to vote on them. Um, I'm in a few uh, RPM um, language-based packaging groups. Um, Apple has one, uh, Python, Brass, Golang. So yeah, I guess I like packaging stuff. And for the past seven and a half years, I've been working at Meta. Um, I've been lucky enough to actually be paid to work on Linux-related stuff for the past Six years, ouch. <laughs> so first of all, since this thing uh, kept coming up, like what is production engineering? If uh, I have to summarize it in like a one sentence, it's basically very similar to what Google called SRE, but not quite. Um, so basically, we are hybrid software and system engineers. Uh, we work mostly uh, focusing on like scalability and performance and security rather than developing new features. It, if you think it sounds a bit like putting an OS uh, distribution together, it's not that um, far removed, which is why it's, uh, it's nice to be able to work on OS. And why, do we, why, why does my company care about um, working with uh, Linux distributions? Well, um, we are probably the largest uh, CentOS uh, stream uh, deployment in the world. We run it on millions of servers. I don't have the exact number, and if I do, I cannot tell you anyway. We, we mostly run stock CentOS stream. Uh, we backport certain things, like we, um, we have a big kernel team in-house working on things like uh, ButterFS. So we run our own kernel. We have a lot of people working on systemd, and we do run our own like, uh, newer systemd. Roughly like, um, about the same systemd that uh, Fedora use, or just a bit newer. And sometimes, because we run things like ButterFS in production, we cannot use the samples um, stream kernel anyway, and we also need to ship some like uh, user space utilities that are not in rel because, and stream because it doesn't make sense. Like ButterFS Prox is not available. And yeah, like if you are, if you are like uh, working for any company that uh, deploys, has a reasonably large deployment of uh, enterprise Linux, whether it's rel or CentOS stream or Alma or Oracle Linux or whatever. You, you need Apple anyway, because you'll know that um, RHEL and CentOS does not ship with all the packages you need, because it's understandable, like uh, Red Hat basically uh, need to guarantee uh, support for the packages they ship, and you don't want to support arbitrary packages for 10 plus years. And also, like, uh, more selfishly, like, uh, Meta maintains a lot of open source projects. We want to get these projects in front of users, and also, since um, in-house we mostly run like x86, uh, it's good to actually like uh, have the projects built like in distros, and we identify issues with the build scripts or issues with like um, architectures we don't test on. So, what's the problem then? Well, if you if you have been packaging for a long time, you probably have a similar issue with me. Like, um, I have six. I swear it was 300 something last time I checked. I have 600 uh, packages that I'm in the ACL directly for, and I have 6,000 packages, almost exactly 10 times, so weird, uh, that I have access to groups. And basically, based on the filter I apply, like I, I still have 54 things I need to look at. So the number of packages keep growing uh, incrementally, right? Like, um, I mean, and some language stacks are worse than others. Like uh, if you do a lot of uh, RAS or Golang packaging, you'll notice that there are tiny, tiny uh, packages and like uh, every, sim every simplest like, uh, program you want to compile pull in like uh, 20 or 30 of them. So packages are really granular. That means like uh, it's great if you are like a developer, if you're a packager or if you're in security, then it's like, oh my God, I have to audit all these things. So it's like the SKCD thing, right? Like, uh, you know, like, um, Oh, there's like, um, 
there's too many packages, uh, or like, you know, people don't agree on how to implement something, so let's write a new one. This will replace everything, except none of the old ones die, and you just have to maintain one more thing. The other part of the scaling issue is that the number of people who are interested in maintaining packages in an OS does not scale the number of packages. So some engineers are like, well, you know, I like writing features, or, you know, like I, I don't want to actually package this thing. And, well, you know, you're like, a, you get someone interested in packaging, and then they say, well, you know, like, but I'm switching teams, and like my new team uh, tell me to work on something else that does not involve packaging this. Or, you know, like, oh, you know, like, I'm, I want to reduce the amount of time I spend on packaging, but most of my time is taken up packaging, so I cannot actually work on, the, on making things better. And the other problem um, you might have if you um, maintain too many things is that you start having a problem of like, well, I have these 600 packages. Which ones do I need for what? And like, uh, which ones, like, uh, when, if I see like a CVE on one of my package, which is the important one? Should I focus on this one first or the other one? So, you know, the number of packages you maintain grow over time. Some of these are more important, but which ones? So, yeah, like, um, so I'm going to propose some solutions here, like uh, this, some of these are things I'm working on, some of these are things that will be nice to have, but uh, no, no one is working on them yet. I'm trying to be agnostic about, um, you know, like, I don't care how things are solved, but, you know, like, this is probably a problem a lot of us are facing, and um, if these are solved, um, or if you guys can come up with other things I'm not considering, uh, then... I'm happy to take any one solution. So, <clears throat> one, um, so like uh, at work, uh, a lot of our um, repositories internally are monorepos. I'm not, like, I'm not a really big fan of monorepos, but one thing that's nice um, compared to like um, the packaging space um, is that you have access to basically everything, right? Like you can touch anything. Sure, someone has to review it, but. Um, the change, uh, changing anything in the code base like, uh, happens in a consistent way. Whereas if you have like 20,000 packages and you need to touch like uh, 5,000 of them because you're refactoring something uh, and like uh, you have to bug um, 5,000, potentially 5,000 different maintainers because you don't have access to any of this. Um, Fedora kind of get around with this. Uh, basically large changes are normally um, get helped by proven packages who can commit to any package there's still the political issue of like people getting upset if you touch their package, so you have to give them notice and everything. Um, this does not help those of us working on Apple because like, um, <coughs> even proven packages don't have access to actually create new branches for packages they don't own. Um, so <coughs> things are improving. Like, um, we have some policies in place to actually make sure that things we try to get into Apple get actioned on like, um, within a bound ticket, uh, set of time. Uh, newer uh, language-based like, uh, groups basically decide that we want to move into a group uh, maintainership instead of... Oh, God. No. <coughs> so if you are maintaining a RAS package or a Go package in Fedora, um, those are maintained by the whole uh, SIG. So if you, if you are interested in like, um, doing a lot of work, you join the SIG and you, you get to touch everyone's package. Except that like, um, the, uh, we basically just look at the package prefix and if it matches, we grant permission. And end user applications in Go and RAS are often like, uh, not named you know, like Golang something or RAS something. So you still have this issue that by policy, the SID should have access, but they might not get it automatically. So yeah, um, um, the next thing you do, right? Like if, um, if the amount of work exceeds the number of people working on it, it's like you want to make things easier by automating what you can automate. Like can we automate creating packages? Can we automate reviewing packages and maintaining packages? And, you know, like, what sort of QA do we do on packages? So this is um, 
If you have not seen it, this is like uh, the release monitoring dashboard. You can basically uh, sign your package up um, to this, and you can say like, hey, you know, like uh, this is like my project. Um, this is like uh, the back end. Like uh, this is where you can go and like uh, fetch new versions, and it will um, file a bug uh, for you, saying like, hey, you know, like um, the latest version in Rawhide is like a uh, three point um, one point zero point like uh, something, and like two point three point eight is available. Which is great if you have hundreds of packages and you can't keep track of like you don't want to, you know, like pull like all the upstream like uh, feeds to find out which one is uh, new. Um, for bootstrapping Apple, uh, every three years there is a new version of Enterprise Linux out, and any package from Fedora that is not um, Red Hat does not want to maintain is not there. And basically, like um, so, we have a bootstrapping problem. You want you care about 50 packages not in Apple, and then you realize that, oh wait, the transitive dependencies means like you actually need to branch 400 packages. So eBranch um, calculates the transitive graph of all the missing dependencies, and how to chain build them. Like, oh, you know, like if you have all these packages like uh, branched, this is how you can build them in parallel. And for packages you don't actually own, it can actually help you like um, File the request to get them branched and like um, escalate them if uh, they are stuck. So I did 314 update sets for Apple 9, and this is mostly using like uh, a branch. And there are some talks uh, linked that you can just like um, go to after this. Uh, this thing is currently a bit broken, um, and I don't have time to fix it right now, but. Um, um, it will get fixed because Apple 10 is landing and I have to use this again at some point. So yeah, scaling is an issue, right? Like, um, do I work on my packages or do I actually work on the tooling? Uh, the release monitoring uh, thing I, met, I showed earlier, uh, Davide um, here like, um, has his tool that's really nice for onboarding new packages that automate doing that for you. Like, oh, I have a new Rust package, I want to uh, let the RAS SIG like, um, maintain the package, and I want to set like, the bugzilla assignee so that uh, the SIG gets new bugs. I'm working on this new tool for like, doing the bookkeeping stuff, so I can say, hey, I care about these 50 packages. I also want to care about packages that they depend on, and I want to care about packages that link against my package, so I know like, uh, what to test if I change things. So these two are kind of like eBranch and like Poi Tracker are kind of um, tied together in that I need to refactor a bunch of stuff because they need um, some libraries in common. Um, the other thing that we can, that is coming soon, uh, that will make things easier is that RPM, the, the latest release of RPM that's now in Fedora and might be in EL10 soon, hopefully, um, makes it easier to do uh, builds declaratively and generate specs in a dynamic um, Python and Rust right now kind of cheap. Um, they have like RPM generators that use uh, custom uh, macros uh, to do some of this. And it will be nice to eventually basically have RPM support most, more of the functionality. So yeah, if you are a Rust maintainer, you're already using like a Rust to RPM to actually uh, build your spec each time. Go to RPM and then pip to spec do the same things on uh, Golang and Python, except I think they are not actually mandatory. You don't have to use them. So yeah, so that's creating new packages. Uh, next is reviewing packages. Uh, Fedora has this thing called Fedora Review. It's kind of like uh, in maintenance. So if you know Python uh, or you, you like to help with CICD, please help. Like, uh, we are all friendly. And we don't have time to actually like, uh, give this the amount of attention it needs. Um, so this is already running like, in copper automatically. You'll notice if you submit a new package for review, it will automatically run Fedora review for it. It will build and run the review when it works. Sometimes a bit flaky. Um, so yeah, this thing generates a review template and fill out some of it that you can fill out. And then like um, the reviewer has to fill out the rest of the questions. It's a really old Python project. I've recently fixed the, uh, the release process so you can actually uh, easily cut the release now. But we need to hook it up to CI. so. So we know when it's break, uh, broken. 
Uh, the next thing that's great um, that uh, recently became available is uh, Packet. Um, if you've been to some of the Packet talks in the conference, uh, you would have seen it. Since last year, you can use Packet to actually automate putting up a PR for you whenever there's a new version of a software you package, which is really cool. Um, unfortunately, if you're like a, if you maintain KDE like Neil, or if you um, or if you maintain like a, some of like a Meta's open source projects like us, like um, there are things that you have to build like as a set, and you cannot just uh, build one package. And Packet does not support uh, building a set of packages right now, but it's coming soon. Uh, of course, if you automate your package uh, release process, you really, really want to run tests automatically, right? Like, um, if, the, if there's a PR put up for your package automatically and it just merge and it automatically gets built and released, like, um, where do you fit in like, doing manual testing? The answer is you don't. So at the very least, like, a unit test must be run. And this is a problem right now because um, when I did a Python cleanup recently, I noticed that a lot of packages don't even have uh, un any unit tests running. It's in the guideline they tell you that you should run some tests, but nothing happens if you don't. So. so we might want to consider at some point basically saying, hey, you know, like we will generate a warning if you don't run tests. And maybe we can do it like Debian where we say like, hey, if you, if you don't suppress um, an RPM lint warning with an explanation, then it will show up in the dashboard and say like, oh, this package has something set with attention. And for things that are beyond the scope of unit testing, there's a TMT, test management tool, that you can use um, to define some integration tests for your package, which will be run when your package is built. So some pain points. <clears throat> um, this is uh, what happens when you put up a, an update for Fedora in a body. It will tell you, oh, this is like a, that's a software name, that's a package, that's a type of like a update, this is a bug fix. Um, and there are automated tests that run on your package without you having to define anything. You can define extra tests, but by default, it does a static analysis, so it will tell you, hey, my library like, uh, breaks uh, some ABI, like some symbols are missing, or my package does not install. Thank you. This is the same package built for Apple. No automated tests. <laughs> so like, uh, this is something that we in Fedora cannot fix, unfortunately. Like, uh, we need to talk to some people um, at Red Hat who like, manage uh, the teams. So hopefully this can be fixed soon because this is really annoying and unfortunate. You want Apple packages to be more reliable than Fedora packages because of the different type of like, customers using it, not less, um, <coughs> less reliable. If you are working on a CentOS SIG, like, the situation is even more dire. Uh, there is no body. Like, so there is no like, a proper release process you build, and then you, you do your own testing on your package, and if you think it's ready, you tag the package for release, and it goes, get pushed in the mirror. Yay. No, you know, like, yeah, there's no record of, like, how did you test? What did you test? You know, like, uh, how do you know if... So, so hopefully, you know, like, um, someone here, like, uh, knows how to fix it. And there are some more general pain points. Um, you know, like uh, Fedora gets developed piecemeal over time. Sometimes there are duplicated functionality and integrations a bit missing. Like um, I mentioned, Packet can like uh, do scratch builds and do, do put up a PR that you can just like merge and it will like uh, build your new package. Uh, there is an older system called the New Hotness that if you configure it um, in the past it will basically not only file a bug saying like, hey, you have a new, you can update your package. It will also do a scratch build for you. Clearly this is not needed anymore, but um, you can potentially waste like our finite build system resources by like building something twice. Three times, because when you actually merge it, then it will do a final build. Um, RPM lint is badly underutilized in Fedora compared to Lintian in Debian. And it doesn't really like keep up with the packaging guidelines, which is a bit sad. Like uh, if we want to turn it on and enforce it right now, we can't, because a lot of the policies, it will warn you about things that are not actually problems. Especially if you are unfortunate enough to work on something like a guile, where RPM Lint will yell at you because 
the packaging is weird, and we just need to define a new standard for it. So my dream state is to have something like Debian Janitor, which is a bit like how Packet can uh, suggest package updates for you. This thing can suggest fixes uh, that actually like, uh, address some uh, lint issues. Uh, some more things. Um, so like, um, if you work on Apple or if you, like, um, if you work on any EL uh, releases, you notice that uh, some packages are built for Enterprise Linux, and then like, uh, the devil packages are not shipped. Because if you ship something, you have to support it. Uh, we might, it will be really nice and really helpful for those of us working on Apple if we just say like, Apple can use like, um, the, the packages that are built but not shipped. Because uh, as long as we don't then like, ship something that depends on it. And the other pain point is sometimes RHEL has the software that you want, so you cannot have it in Apple, but the version is too old. Doing compact packages in uh, Python is really, really a pain because the way we install Python modules, uh, you cannot really have two versions um, installed side by side. Uh, if you work on SIG, the other things that are missing is there is no side tech support. So if you are building a bunch of stuff, you have to build them one at a time and then like, just take all of them for release. Um, there's a workaround, I guess. If you, if you are not ready to do a final build yet, you can build in copper. So yeah, uh, in conclusion, like, um, I listed a bunch of stuff that are my pain points and my people <coughs> solutions. If you have other things, like, uh, feel free to like, talk to me and like, um, suggest ideas or suggest other problems. Or if you want to help out with some of this, let me know. Um, there are some links. Like, uh, here's like, one link um, about how, like, um, more about production engineering. And like, uh, there's, a talk that, there's a list of talks that my team does. Yeah, um, we ran out of um, We lost a bit of time, but I think we still have five minutes for questions. Yes, at the back. The one problem I have with the, I think it's called TMT, the YAML based YAML test. I have tests such as which I wanted to make a test, but I can't have those as basic tests. Hmm. So the question is how to make new gating tests uh, with TMT. Uh, well, the question is, I have, I have upstream tests, I have a make and make check, mm -hmm. but I can't run those on gating tests. But you should be running them inside the check of your package, right? I so if that, but I, I, want, I don't want to write another set of tests. Ah. I've already got tests. So. Right, but if your test fails, the package build will fail, right? So you well, don't even get to the gating tests. Ah. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I see what you mean. So, how to deal with slow tests? Like, can you, like, um, without duplicating all the test setup, can you just say, this is a slow test, I want to run it later? Yeah. I'm not sure. That's a good question. <laughs> Anything else? Yes. Uh, you mentioned site tagging as one of the main ideas. What do you mean by that? By uh, site tagging? Sorry? Uh, site tagging. Oh, yes. Um, site right. So the question is, like, uh, what, is, um, what do I mean by site tag? Um, so basically, <clears throat> site tag is basically a way for you to uh, make, um, make some packages available that are not released yet. So, you know, like, instead of, like, I'm building against whatever is released for, like, uh, Fedora Rawhide, you can also say, I also want to make this uh, set of packages available uh, for building against, and then, like, when you're done, you can basically um, put up an update with all the packages in your site tag. So it's a way of basically uh, adding overrides um, to, um, to the package build process. How are we doing for time? Okay, we have three minutes. Uh, maybe one or two more questions. Eight minutes. Oh, 50. Oh, we have seven minutes. Yeah. 
Right. If there's no more questions, thank you so much for coming, and feel free to ping me afterwards. <laughs>